everybody, welcome to part one of your worm video notes. So this video is gonna go over a couple of the worm phyla that we'll start with. So first we're gonna start with phylum platyhelminthes, which are also known as the flatworms. Here's some general characteristics of flatworms then. So they are flattened dorsoventrally. If you remember, dorsal ventral is back and stomach, so flattened basically top to bottom is how they're flattened, not side to side. They are triploblastic, meaning three body layers, acelomate, so they do not have a true coelom, and they are bilaterally symmetrical, which is the first animal we're talking about that is bilateral, and they are also unsegmented, so there are not different segments. And then if you look just over here to the right, here's just a few examples of various flatworm species. Let's talk about the body systems then. So flatworms typically have a common opening, which means that one opening serves as both the mouth and the anus for the worm. However, waste is excreted through something called nephridiopores, and they're these flame cells that are around these pores that help excrete that waste. Their nervous system in general is pretty basic. Um, they have some sort of cerebral ganglion and some nerve cords, but the parasitic species are going to be less developed. This is because parasitic species rely on their host. They don't need to live by themselves out in the world, so they don't really need a nervous system compared to those that are free living. In terms of reproduction, flatworms are simultaneous hermaphrodites, which means they have both male and female reproductive organs, and those release their gametes at the same time. They also can reproduce asexually versus via transverse fission, which just means they kind of divide their body and they separate. And parasitic species, which we'll get into this more in just a minute, they have multiple hosts and different larval stages. So the larval stage may live in one type of animal while the adult stage lives in a different type of animal. All right, so this is probably one of the coolest things about flatworms and specifically planaria, which we will actually do in class as well. So planaria can do something called regeneration. So if they were to get injured or a predator may like bite part of them off, they can actually regenerate that part. So I wanna show you a quick clip that just shows how a planaria can regenerate. So this planaria was cut in half. So you see the head on the left, the tail on the right, So there's the tail, and the tail is actually going to grow a head, and then the head will grow a tail. Skip ahead a little bit here. So there's your tail end, and you see the, the eyes, they, well, they're not true eyes, but you see them starting to take shape, and the head as well, and that's only four days later. They can already regenerate into that. And then there's the head part. That is starting to grow the tail. All right, so pretty cool that they can do that. And you will actually do that to some planaria as well. So in terms of flatworm diversity, then there's four classes that you need to know. So first is class Turbularia. And these are the free living ones that are, they're not parasitic, they don't live inside of other organisms, like the cute little planaria we just saw on that video. So these are typically either predators or scavengers, and a planaria is an example here. Class Trematoda are parasites of other animals, and these ones look more like leeches, although leeches are not flatworms. We'll talk about those later. But an example here would be a fluke. So like liver flukes are really, really common. Monogenea is another class, and they're called monogenea because they have one generation life cycle. So mono meaning one, and these are external parasites. And then cestoidea, these are tapeworms. These are the parasitic species that have this like really crazy hooked mouth that actually anchors to the inside of your intestine or your stomach. And then their reproductive structures or proglottids are really, really efficient, and they make lots and lots of eggs. 
All right, so a little more about parasites then. We have, like I mentioned, two different hosts that parasites live in. So the primary host is going to be where the adult form feeds, reproduces, and then the intermediate host is where the larval form feeds and reproduces. So there's also some species of concern that you should be aware of. So there's three total that we'll get into more detail with. So first being schistomiasis. So these flatworms, they actually bore into the skin and then they travel to your circulatory system and end up inflaming the body. So this poor little boy we see in this picture here, that's actually trapped eggs under his skin that can cause that inflammation. The Chinese liver fluke lives in humans, but also dogs and cats. And this is from eating raw fish. So you can get exposure to these from eating raw fish. And then lastly, tapeworms, right? So beef and pork tapeworms, they result in digestive problems and weight loss issues. And this is typically from eating undercooked meat. You consume the egg or a part of a tapeworm and it grows into an adult in your body. So then, <clears throat> a little fun, right? How to be an effective parasite. So flatworms are very effective parasitic worms. First of all, like I talked about with the tapeworm, they have really good attachment. So that scolex that they have, look at those hooks down here. Those things are what bore into your stomach or your intestines and attach and they don't let go. They also have sucker discs that are surrounding the head region. They go all the way around for attachment. Also, high reproductive output. So those proglottids, each of these is a proglottid, but each of those has an ovary, a testy, it has a way for the sperm and eggs to be released. So every single one of those pieces can produce eggs and sperm, and as a result, fertilized eggs turning into more tapeworms. And then also, like we mentioned, multiple hosts and generations. So you can try to treat Let's say you try to treat your dog, but your dog got the worms from maybe being out in a cow pasture or eating raw fish out of the trash. So you can't totally eradicate the worm because it's still present in other places. All right, now that we've talked about the creepy crawly flatworms, let's move on to the rotifers. So rotifers are pretty cool structurally and they're very different from flatworms. But first, some general characteristics. So once again, we are triploblastic, so three tissue layers. This time, though, they are pseudocoelomates. So they have some sort of body cavity, but it's false. So it doesn't actually exist like a true body cavity like we have. They also have a complete digestive tract, meaning there's a mouth and an anus that are separate openings. So it comes in the mouth, out the anus. It's not one common opening. Additionally, they have a posterior end with some little toes and adhesive glands for them to stick on the surface. The coolest part of rotifers is this organ called a corona that's at the top of their head and it has all these little, little cilia on it and it moves and it kind of filter feeds as it brings food to the rotifer. And then they also do something called parthenogenesis, which is just fertilization from unfer or reproduction from unfertilized eggs. All right. So in terms of body systems, Externally, they have something called a cuticle, which often then thickens even more to form this hard outside shell called a lorica. Their feeding, like we talked about, that corona creates that water current. And then inside their mouth, they have something called a mastax, which helps to grind the food up that they eat. Nervous system, once again, they do have a simple form of a brain and nerve cords. And then reproduction, like we talked about, parthenogenesis, is that reproduction from unfertilized eggs. So an egg could never be fertilized and still produce a new rotifer, which is like mind boggling to think about. So two different kinds of eggs, though, that you should also be aware of. So amictic eggs are via mitosis. So they're clones. They're asexual in that manner. And they develop into more amictic females. Mictic eggs, on the other hand, are produced via meiosis. So if they're unfertilized, this is where it's crazy, they still turn into males. If they're fertilized, they turn into more amictic females. So this is why there tends to be a lot more females than males in a rotifer population. So here's the general body structure. And if I were you, I'd also pause here to complete the diagram on your notes or to draw this and label it yourself. But as you look at this image here, you also see all those little cilia moving. That's what's on the corona and that's moving the food into the rotifer. So you see that little green food piece come down and it gets moved right into the body. Pretty cool. 
All right, and last up for this video is phylum nematoda. So these are the roundworms. Roundworms, once again, are triploblastic pseudocelomate, unsegmented, so they're still very similar to the rotifers. Um, this time, though, they're vermiform, which means worm shape, and they have longitudinal muscles, so muscles that run down their body that help with them to move, which is almost like a thrashing movement. And then they are covered in a three-layer cuticle. So their body systems are a little different. So externally, they have that cuticle, but it actually has three layers. So it's different than the rotifers. And the outside layer helps resist digestion because guess what? With roundworms, we also have some parasitic species. Nervous system, same general structure, except this time there's a nerve ring, not that ganglia, but there are still nerves running the length of the body. And reproduction, they are dioecious, meaning male and female organs are in different bodies, but they are also dimorphic. So males are smaller in size than the female, so it's easy to distinguish between a male and a female. And then after copulation, or a fancy word for mating, the females actually store the sperm in their bodies and then use that sperm to fertilize the eggs. So here's just the general structure of a roundworm. You see the nerve ring is an important thing to note. It almost looks like a choker or a collar around the worm. And then you see the intestine. They have that cuticle covering the false coelom. But then also you see there's a mouth and an anus, so that complete digestive tract. And you do want to pause here as well and either sketch this and label it or label it on your notes. And then, unfortunately, like we said, roundworms are also parasitic. So there are five major roundworm parasites that I want to talk to you about. So first is Ascaris. These ones live in the small intestine of humans. They are very common um, to find. Pinworms are actually the most common roundworms in the U.S., and they're very tiny. They live in your large intestine, but this is the gross part. They actually come out of your anus at night, lay their eggs, go back in, and, of course, when they lay their eggs there, it's itchy, so then you scratch it and you touch something else, and then you spread their eggs. Pretty disgusting when you think about it. The New World hookworm is also something to be aware of because they are very common in the southern United States. And these are even weirder to think about because look at that mouth, first of all, and they bore into your feet. They like to go between your toes, and then they get into your blood system, and they live in your circulatory system. Pork worms are in pork, so if you don't cook pork thoroughly, you can actually ingest the eggs or the little larvae that are inside the skeletal muscles of the pork, and that's the part that we eat. So if you eat undercooked pork, you can actually be exposed to pork worms. And last up, filarial worms. These are found in tropical countries, but they cause something called elephantitis, and we'll talk about this more in class, but in case you're curious, you should probably Google that. It's pretty gross to look at. But they live in the lymphatic system, so as a result, they block your vessels, and it causes fluid buildup. So if you've ever seen images of people with really, really swollen legs or like one leg's really swollen and one's not, it's usually a result of elephantitis. All right, that is it for your notes so far for this unit.